The first question actually goes to Sean. Um, Sean, I really need to know, um, the, probably the most important thing I'm going to ask today, uh, how did you get involved as the dad in the Taylor Swift music video? <laughs> That, that I have been asked that question a lot. And I actually called my social media director slash cultural guru, Ryan Reynolds. And I was like, Ryan, people keep asking. I'm actually being asked to do like interviews about it. Do I explain the whole convoluted origin story? <laughs> and my guru slash social media advisor, Ryan Reynolds, Van City Reynolds said, just don't. It's cooler if you don't. So I'm actually... <laughs> going to violate my own nature, which is to be verbally promiscuous, and I'm going to play it kind of cool. I don't often play it. Okay. Uh, I'll just friend, say this. That, just is, say that? That, is, that, is, that is not an off-camera head of hair that Sean Levy has over there. That is a, uh, that should be a front and center mug right there, I'm afraid. There might have been a side letter with T-Swift that if the hair was well featured, yes, I would come and play. Who doesn't want to be in a Taylor Swift music video? I mean, come on. Yeah. Right. I, I just, Ryan, I just have to ask you as the as the actor of the group, uh, did you have any critiques of Sean's performance and his reaction at the table? Do you want to give him any notes for future things? I actually thought he was fantastic. You know, Sean started as an actor. So that's what makes him such a great director. Get into that head. Yeah. But you know great. what? He's great. Literally, Perfect. Flawless. I, I, as I told you, Ryan, I was sitting at the table with Sadie and Dylan, and Dylan is telling me some improvised story, and Taylor's like, action, cut. And I remember saying to Dylan, I have I did not hear a word of what you were saying. All I was thinking about <laughs> is why are you doing that with your hands? Why are you laughing so maniacally? Um it definitely gave me a taste of being back on camera, <laughs> reminded me why I do not want it. Uh, Ryan, your better half uh, recently directed a Taylor Swift music video, made me think about you and directing. Have you actually thought about it or is that something that just doesn't interest you? Um, I, you know, it, it genuinely doesn't interest, storytelling interests me in every way, shape and form. Producing interests me in every way, shape and form. Same with performing. And I get to work with guys like Sean Levy. I don't know why I would, uh, try to think I can do that on my own. Um, that would be idiotic. If I could direct something with Sean Levy down the road someday, uh, that would be nice. But um, no, I mean, I, I, uh, I love the position I'm in. I love that I get to work with folks that I get to work with. And I also just really feel like, you know, why, why, why would I deprive myself of that amazing collaborator? You know, I just think that that's so important um, in everything that I do. I don't, ever pretend to be a person who's just, you know, unilaterally deciding this or that, or, or, you know, I just love, I love the creative process of having someone to bounce something off, off of. I love the creative process of trial and error of, of, you know, r ripping something apart and rebuilding it again. It's just, that's, that's, that's the thing that I'm most interested in. I love doing that with someone. I, I also, uh, Steve, we, I could take a deeper dive into this, but I really have to say, obviously Ryan has been, a, a famous actor and, and a star for a long time, but I had never really, uh, I've never had a, an actual f a fellow producer alongside me who was as additive and is as additive to every step of the process as Ryan. I think if I'm not mistaken, I mean, Ryan's produced like four movies and it's two Deadpools and it's Free Guy and Adam Project. And I think that the level of craft, the level of execution in all four of those and by the way, it's also noteworthy that they're so different from each other. But I never kind of knew that you could have in a fellow producer someone where in script, in casting, on set, in the edit, in song selection, in score, in sound mix. These are things where Ryan and I have been very much in lockstep and um, kind of as a duo on Free Guy and Adam Project. And um, no, he's as a filmmaker and so much more than just as a performer, um, he's the real deal. Uh, you guys have, you guys are really involved in the, in the movie business. And I think from the outside, people think of the movie business in a certain way. What do you think might surprise people about the actual making of a movie that they just don't know about? That it's like obstacles you guys have to deal with all the time that just isn't talked about. I'm just trying to shine a light on, you know, trying to educate people. I mean, I, I would say that, that, you know, th look, there's, there's vast differences between 
you know, a, a set you might find yourself on of ours and someone else's. I mean, they're all, you know, they sort of tend to have their own kind of language or feel, but, you know, I, it, it's, it's sort of like running any other business. That's the thing I, at least I find most shocking is that it's important. And if, certainly for Sean and I, the movies that we produce together to come in on time, you know, on or under budget and, and finish either on time or early and, and, you know, having a kind of responsibility in that position is, is certainly important to me. I know it's important to Sean. Um, and then, you know, I think about little Walker Scobell, who's in Adam Project with us, who just couldn't believe that there was more than four people who make a movie. You know, I mean, like he, his first day on set, he just looked like he had two dinner plates for eyes because he was expecting that it was going to be Sean and me and maybe a cameraman and somebody who might, you know, uh, have snacks. Uh, and he's not wrong, but there's, you know, hundreds of other people that, that, that go into baking this cake. And, um, you know, I think that was pretty eye-opening for him at least. I would add, Steve, maybe the other thing that people don't, don't realize is every day at every stage, if you're open to ideas that come to you on the fly, they end up being movie defining decisions. And, uh, and so whether it's, you're acting a scene and you're directing a scene and uh, maybe I come up with, there's a scene in our movie where like we're doing the scene, it was pretty good, but Ryan and I were both like, uh, it's pretty good. And then suddenly I said to Walker, shine the flashlight in Ryan's face, just bug him. Just like shine the flashlight in his face. And then it led to basically the, the centerpiece of the scene where like Ryan steals it out of the kid's hand, he shines it in the kid's face. You never know what are gonna be the small little ideas that make something better. And that carries every day all the way through post-production. Yeah, and if I could if I could pile on one more thought to that, which is that you know, I, 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 the thing I, I genuinely love the most about the privilege it is to making movies is that is is listening to the movie. I mean, when you listen to the movie, it will tell you things. And if you sort of are quite ardent about you know and, and dogmatic about the script and the story has to be this, you know, you you miss out on a lot of things. And it's sort of it's 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 expanding on the same point that Sean just made. But when you really sit there and kind of put your ear to the ground and listen to the story you're telling, it says all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect it to say or tell you. And if you listen to those things, magic happens. And that's that's the part that I think keeps me awake at night and keeps me excited and energized to do this uh, for as long as I, I can possibly do it. Uh, speaking of the Adam Project, um, I'm so curious, how long have you guys been developing this? Was this before Free Guy, during Free Guy? Like, talk a little bit about the genesis of this thing. Well, the script had been developed for like six or seven years before it came to Ryan and then me. So Jonathan Tropper, uh, it was an idea that some other writers had in Skydance and developed it for six or seven years with Jonathan Tropper. And then David Ellison told Ryan, Ryan and I were in post-production on Free Guy. David said, I have this movie that I think you might like. And as I recall it, Ryan, he pitched you the idea and you had a pretty immediate feeling that, oh, this could be something for us, right? Yeah, it was what was odd, though, was that, again, like it's 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 one of those weird, I don't mean to be too esoteric, but kind of kismet things, which is that Sean and I were both looking for a story about that that sort of told the father, son, mother, son story in a in a in a strange new light. And we had been actually flirting with another project, which had a kind of interestingly similar dynamic to my dynamic with Mark Ruffalo in the film, who's, who plays my father, who's, you know, roughly the same age as me. And we, I, and I, we love that wish fulfillment, but we've been flirting with this other film for a long time. And it just felt kind of square peg round hole. It wasn't quite getting there. And that's when David Ellison at, at Skydance, you know, he came over to my apartment and like, you know, that's, that never happens. I mean, David Ellison's a pretty, He's as big a big shot as it gets. So, you know, when he sits down and he's there to tell you something that he's very passionate about. And I love that he was so passionate about this story. Um, you know, you don't find that every day either in a, in a, in a person who's running a, a, a huge production company slash studio like Skydance. So, uh, it, but it just, it was it. It rung all the bells. It, it was everything, you know, and I, and I basically went running to Sean uh, to either beg him or threaten him, whatever kind of came first or came to top of mind to do this movie uh, uh, together. And uh, thankfully he, he saw the same mechanics that I saw that made it so romantic and, and beautiful. 
one of the things about the film that I think it does so, one of the many things it does so well is it balances all these different tones. It's emotional, it has heart, it has great action. You know, it, it, it's really hard to pull off what you guys did. Can you sort of talk about how the F did you pull this off in terms of balancing all these different things? You know, I, tone is, I'm, I'm, the longer I do this job, the more I think, well, tone is my job. Tone is a director's job. That is your job to have some North Star instinct about what the movie should feel like. And I remember uh, actually back when you and I met, Steve, uh, circa Real Steel, the shooting of Real Steel, and Spielberg was one of the producers. And I remember uh, one of the things, uh, one of the conversations I had with him, I said, you know, there's like an infinite number of shots at every given moment. How do you know the right angle? And he said to me, the way you picture it, that makes it right. The way you picture it that's the right one. And so it, there was something about, well, okay, I guess that's kind of all you have is your instinct about what is the right way to do it. So for me, tone, Free Guy is a very specific tone and it's very different than Adam Project. And Brian and I loved, by the way, that our back-to-back -back movies would be very different from one another. But on Adam Project, kind of an old school blend of spectacle, warmth, humor, and aspirational wish fulfillment. It's a lot of words. It's a lot of like hands on faders to go with like the mixing board analogy and as to where things go up and down, that's instinct. And that's kind of the only skill I have is as the longer I do this job, trusting that, trusting that instinct. And it's also, I think it's also one of the things I love about working with Sean is that Sean has a very sort of unique perspective on films. When he's directing a film and he's there on set, he's also in that very moment sitting in the audience. And I feel like that is a superpower that, that cannot be overlooked because it really allows him a kind of, in the moment, a real objective sort of point of view on what's happening and how this feels. And I like to think I'm sitting there next to him stealing his popcorn or whatever you want to say, but like, I love that as well. And I think it's, it's so important to do that in these moments, particularly in movies like this, where those tones are so important and you're you you know you're using the kind of fader analogy that he used, which I love, but that sort of equalizer sort of idea to kind of, you know, add a little bit more here, a little bit less there. And, and it's, uh, yeah, that feeling is so important. And that, that's the thing I always grab onto the most is, is what, what is the feeling this movie is trying to convey? What is that? What is that? Um, and I, I love that. I mean, I loved how Free Guy was joy, you know, and we made that kind of in an particularly in an era that I wouldn't say, would certainly wouldn't uh, be uh, naive enough to say that we're completely out of yet, but it was a really tough period in history. I mean, it's like, we're all, you know, the, the, the news cycles are just absolutely intense. And it was this, this opportunity to tell a story in, via a film that really just expressed pure joy and radiated that. And I love that about it. And Adam Project is similarly expresses a kind of warmth and nostalgic sort of feeling that is uh that that are that you know were films that we grew up with watching loved you know amblin movies that you know took us away yeah. i i feel like so much of the kind of movie marketplace now it's like movies are they tend to be one of two things they tend to be popcorn escapism or emotional weighty thematic uh, you know a kind of idea based movies and i'd like to think and I know my favorite movies, they get, they get both. They are unembarrassed about wanting to entertain and they are absolutely determined to also make you feel, to also make you connect to themes that feel relatable and resonant. So with Adam Project, we wanted an old fashioned, eat your popcorn, enjoy the ride kind of movie. But we also believe that if we did our jobs right, you could connect to feelings in people that are universal. The way we look back at ourselves, the way we forgive our parents, the way we come to appreciate our parents, uh, all of this, that's what the movie's about. So to entertain, but also to connect. Those were like the dual goals for us on Adam Project. Uh, in the film, you reference a lightsaber. There's also a nod in the third act that I, I won't reveal between that, that happens. Um, I'm just curious, with your relationship after Free Guy, was it easy to get these things in the movie or was it still a challenge? To be clear, Steve, there is no lightsaber in the movie. But, we no, but, do like, have, but you say lightsaber. We do. And when it came time to design that device, 
that is actually called a MAGSIL. I don't know why. We can ask Jonathan Tropper. It's like M-A-G capital C-Y-L. Magnetic cylinder? I don't know. Um, I had to design it. Basically, fear of lawsuit led me to multiple design iterations so that it was never just going to be a shafty beam of light, uh, especially a double-sided thing like Darth Maul used to wield. Um, so no, we didn't need permission this time because we're saving those cards for when we really need it on free guy movies. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and also, also the kid, you know, the kid really does sort of react to it the way any kid would, which is like, is that a lightsaber? You know, and I, my character says it's not a lightsaber and he, he's just convinced it is, which I sort of love that as a bit of a runner. Uh, Walker is so fantastic in this movie. And he, I absolutely believe he's a young Ryan. He has no professional acting experience in terms of this is his first movie. How did you both know this was the kid? And because he really has to deliver a performance or this movie is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has to deliver a performance and he has to be believably young Ryan. So those yes. are different things, right? He needed the emotional heft and dimension to deliver pretty important emotional content, but he also needed to be a freaking smart ass punk who probably got beat up a lot because of the mouth on him. And uh, I have no knowledge about that being a part of your history, Ryan, but it wouldn't shock me uh, to hear that maybe <laughs> it was, or certainly that your mouth was a weapon. Well, uh, I have three old, I have three older brothers, Sean. That was all I had. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So it, it, it helped that Walker is both inherently super talented but he also and we didn't know this when we hired him he's obsessed with deadpool he has watched both deadpool movies on like inappropriate repeat such that he can now recite them i, I one of the things though about the way walker talks is a lot of the dialogue he says i feel like it's ryan talking so i'm <laughs> curious ryan how much is what he's saying like improvised on the moment? How much is that all scripted in advance? Because it clearly has your fingerprints all over this. Oh, he's, Walker's amazing. I mean, we I'd fire off 10 alts to any given joke or moment, you know? Also, we're always looking for it too. Again, Sean and I both were sitting there listening to this movie. So there's, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that come about out of nowhere um, and and work in, in, in surprising ways. Uh, but, but not the least of which is you, you could throw that kid anything and he'll deliver it perfectly. I mean, it was just unbelievable. He, it really felt like, he felt like a much more um, extroverted version of me as a kid. I was much more shy than he was, but, but he, he really could turn that on. But actually Walker in real life is quite shy. You know, Walker in real life is a kid that, you know, I think lives in his head a little bit and and you know that I'm not saying that that's an easy thing necessarily but I know it 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 gives him a kind of dimension and depth that you don't find with a lot of kids at 12 years old and he 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 really he really delivered that I really felt like his mouth and the smart aleck or smart ass kind of behavior that he has was similar to mine which was a you know it was a maladaptive coping mechanism it was a it was a, a way to kind of pave over you know uh, other shit going on that uh I, I didn't really want to acknowledge as, as a young kid and as a young man, so. You guys have made, uh, you guys have worked all over the place in Hollywood. Uh, Sean, you have a, you, both of you have worked for Netflix before. Can you sort of talk about what is it, is there any difference to making a film at Netflix versus the other studios <clears throat> or other streamers? Um, I'm just curious about the dynamic behind the scenes. Well, I will, this was my first movie for a streamer. I've not made, I mean, I've made a lot of television starting with Stranger Things for Netflix. And I will say that I found this movie similar to my experience on Shadow and Bone and Stranger Things. And um, in that they really do tend to trust the people they hire. So much like on the shows I do, I would say on, on Adam Project, you know, we got the support, we got input when they, thought something was, you know, uh, worthy of adjustment. They're not going to be shy about giving you notes, but they don't feel like they're in your business. And, you know, but I, do, but I don't want to, so there is a lot of creative autonomy, but I don't want to default to this narrative that, oh, well, the legacy studios are up in your business all the time and Netflix lets you run, run free. The truth is that, mm. um, as we learned with Free Guy, if you, at the stage of career that Ryan and I have worked really hard to achieve, there's a bedrock of trust that we know how to make something responsibly and in a way that audiences 
will like. And if you have that trust from the studio, as we did from Netflix, as we did from Disney and Fox and Free Guy, you tend to be get you're left mostly alone. Um, so I that's would also say that's that's also you know that I think that's also one one sort of hack that I think both Sean and I share this in common, which is that there's not a lot of layers with us. Like you know, with respect to our relationships at the legacy studios and the streamers. There, when you're getting in touch with us, there isn't like I got to go through a, you know, a, an agent or a manager or a lawyer or a publicist. It's just just they we have an open line of communication that that really kind of fosters uh, certainly um, um, accountability, uh, which is which is you know a huge a huge part of why we're able to kind of I think make some of these movies and and tell these stories um, because that does like Sean mentioned sort of create a foundation of trust but also you know one thing I love about Netflix and you know is is their real commitment to telling original stories I mean we get to you know this doesn't happen every day a movie like this getting to make this which isn't based on anything you know and and we felt so spoiled that we got to make Free Guy at Disney you know which is another totally original kind of new idea and a new concept and um, and they they embraced it so wholeheartedly, but Netflix is that's that's what they do over here, and it's pretty it's pretty awesome, I gotta say. Uh, you got did you test screen the Adam Project, and what did you learn from those test screenings that impacted the finished film? We did test Adam Project twice, just as we tested Free Guy twice. Um, the test screenings were extremely encouraging. I had not realized how much of uh, a comedy the movie plays as until I heard it with the test audience. The numbers were very strong as they had been on Free Guy. We learned, uh, you know, it was really interesting. There's a scene that a lot of people talk about. It's a scene in a bar with Ryan and Jen Garner. And oh, they we're are- gonna, We're gonna get there. I, I okay, well, I'm just gonna say, you know what was a, what a, was a shocker? When you do a test screening on a Hollywood movie, you get your scores, but they also get to rank. You're talking about 300 strangers, rank their favorite scenes or least favorite scenes. And you look at those charts and you look for trends. That bar scene, a drama scene, a drama dialogue scene, every time, top two scenes. That doesn't happen with drama scenes. You know, it is not rushed. There's no action. There's not a joke. It's just feeling. And that was where I realized, oh, you know what? We can trust the audience here because they're gonna connect to the emotional part of the movie as much as the action and the comedy. So that was very affirming. And that I learned in test screenings. Did you guys take out, are there a lot of deleted scenes in the movie? Um, I or just asked which ones I wanted to uh, approve to put in the world. And there were only, um, I think we took out four in total. Um, and two of them are are good enough that I'm going to put them out. I don't even know where. Where does it go? Not on a <laughs> anywhere. I was going to. I, I, I was going to say what one should be a collider exclusive, and uh, we will be happy to run it for you. Done and well, done. Well, then I'll tell you this: <laughs> if they'll let us do that, my our personal favor is there was a scene between Ruffalo and Ryan, where basically the father says to the son, "You know, look, somewhere between the villain that you think I am and the hero that young you." thinks I am, there's the real guy. I'm neither. And I'm just a guy doing the best I can. And it is so, I think, honest and true about the way we see our dads or need to see our dads. And um, it's a lovely scene, but to Ryan's point, great scene as a standalone, but that's not enough of a reason to keep it in a cut. The movie needs to tell you what it wants. And as we watched the flow of the narrative, it was like the body rejected that organ in a weird yeah. way. I'm coming up with crazy metaphors today, guys. Um, <laughs> sound mixing boards, surgery and rejected organs. Um, <laughs> but the father, that, that scene with Ruffalo and Ryan, that's, that's one of my favorites. And uh, I'm glad the world will somehow see it maybe on Collider.